Good morning, and welcome to Christ Temple Cathedral St. Louis Virtual Worship Service. Our pastor is Bishop Lindsey Jones. Our mission is to be passionate about loving God, following Christ, and impacting the world. Our service will include one song selection, the preach word by Bishop Jones, and closing remarks with song. Thank you. Enjoy the service.
Good morning and uh, God bless you. Uh, welcome to this uh, worship service and this time in the Word of God. We'd like to invite your attention to the Old Testament book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I will begin reading from the uh, first edition of the New Living Translation of God's Word from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. Verses 1 through 4 declare, After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond of love between them, and they became best of friends. From that day on, Saul kept David with him at the palace and would not let him return home. And Jonathan made a special vow to David's friend. And he sealed the pact by giving him his robe, his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. We'd like to share part one of a message entitled Best Friends Forever. Best Friends Forever. And recently in a uh, tribute to a very beloved and uh, recently deceased best friend, uh, Deacon Jerry Allen, I recalled the story of a contest that was held by a London newspaper offering a very substantial prize for the best answer to a very intriguing question. And this was the question, and it went something like this. What is the shortest distance from Paris to London? What is the shortest distance from Paris to London? It turned out that the winning answer that received the grand prize was this. The shortest distance from Paris to London is good company. The shortest distance from Paris to London is good company. You see, all travelers know that no matter how long the trip, there's something about good company that has a way of shortening a long journey. There's something about good company that causes time to fly and the miles to rapidly pass by. I recall traveling one day with a close friend on a journey that was normally three hours long. But our fellowship and our friendship was such that it caused him to remark the following. He said that I've made this trip several times, but this is the quickest one I've ever had. Yes, there's something about good company that shortens a long journey. And here in our text in 1 Samuel chapter 18, a teenager by the name of David was about to commence likely the longest journey of his young life. It was that grueling, bruising, and faith-building interlude in David's life between the time he was anointed by God as the future king of Israel, but he had not been appointed and installed by God and man as the reigning king. And for those many years, the story of David's life could simply be summed up in one short sentence, run for your life. Because the first part of David's life, uh, he was mainly running from Saul. And the second part of his life, he was running from his own son. But here in our text, in uh, chapter 18, we find God's remarkable expression of faithful and godly love between best friends. For at this time in the David's sojourn, it was Jonathan, the very son of David's tormentor and pursuer Saul, who loved him the most. 
And first of all, when it comes to best friends forever, best friends forever are limited in number. Uh, they are limited in number for covenant relationships or best friends are rare in this life. Uh, look at verse one, because verse one says that after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. And there was an immediate bond of love between them. And uh, look what it says in this translation that they became best of friends. And then verse three says, and Jonathan made a special vow to be David's friend. Uh, you see, whether you realize it or not, there is something different between casual acquaintances versus covenant friends. Uh, for instance, you may have many casual friends, but few best friends. You have may have many acquaintances, several close friends, but very, very, very few best friends. And what characterizes uh, a covenant relationship, what char characterizes a best friend relationship is the degree or the closeness and the oneness that takes place in that relationship that is deep and not just wide. Uh, for notice, if you look in a second Samuel, uh, chapter one, after the tragic death of Jonathan, which we'll look at next week, how David describes his covenant best friend's relationship with David. Uh, in uh, second Samuel chapter one, verse 26, this is what David cries out. It says, uh, David says, how I weep for you, my brother. Jonathan, oh, how much I loved you and your love for me was deeper, deeper than the love of women. Now, notice he didn't say it was sexual. He didn't say it was sensual as that of a woman. So there's no funny business going on between this relationship between David and Jonathan. But what he does say is that his love was deeper than that of a woman. Oh, I don't know that uh, maybe among those of us who grew up in the church and uh, there was a song that we grew up singing uh, 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 deep and wide deep and wide there's a fountain flowing deep and wide a uh, deep and wide uh, deep and wide there's a fountain flowing deep and wide well when you and i are going through long journey experiences in life we need deeply committed covenant friends who God will bring in our life because there is a big difference in having a wide scope of casual friends versus few deeply committed friends. Uh, it was a professor of psychology, uh, Robin uh, Dunmar, uh, Dunbar, and he wondered if the size of your social media network had any correlation to having more friends in real life. It turned out that the average number of Facebook friends possessed by people was around 150. But did you know that out of those 150, only 28 on average were recognized as uh, what we say is low level friends? Now, I didn't say low down friends, but I would say uh, low level or close friends. But then when those same participants were uh, asked how many of those friends would help out in a time of need, would help out in a time of emotional distress, would help out on other crises, can you believe that the average answer was four? Uh, 
The conclusion is simply this. We may have 150 or even 5,000 Facebook friends. We may have uh, 10,000 uh, Twitter friends. But when it comes to a true relationship, the vast majority of these people uh, that are deeply committed are very few. Even Jesus, when he was here on earth, now watch this, Jesus loved everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so there was a crowd of casual acquaintances. But he invested his earthly ministry in only his 12 disciples who were close friends. However, it was only three of those 12 who were core friends. It was only three of those 12 who were covenant friends. It was only three of those 12, James, Peter, James, John, uh, who were the best of friends. And so when it comes to best friends forever, these kind of relationships are rare and limited in number. And so you ought to appreciate if God has blessed you with one or more uh, covenant friends because they are limited in number. Uh, but not only when it comes to best friends forever, uh, these kind of relationships are limited in number, but also when it comes to best friends forever, loneliness is banished. Loneliness is banished for when it comes to the principle of loneliness is banished isolation and loneliness are at epidemic levels in life uh, would you notice in uh, 1 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 18, verse 2, uh, after uh, verse 1 uh, declares a special relationship, uh, it says in uh, chapter 18, verse 2, it says this, From that day on, Saul kept David with him at the palace and wouldn't let him return home or as the uh, New King James translation states, would not let him go home anymore to his father's house. Uh, you see, at this time, the battle between David and Goliath was now over. Uh, the, the, the armies of Israel had uh, routed the armies of Philistines and had chased them all the way back to their own territory. And after this te unknown teenager, David, uh, is the one who ultimately uh, on earth took out Goliath, David is brought to Saul so Saul could find out about David's family. And it says that after Saul found out about David's family and his background, the Bible says that from that day forward, at 16 or 17 years old, David would be separated from his family for an extended period of time. At 16 years old, though surrounded by people in Saul's palace and though promoted beyond his so-called wildest imagination, David would become separated. David would become lonely. David would be isolated from his family. David would be isolated and lonely when it came to friends. David, uh, for an extended period of his life, he would be separated and isolated from all that which was familiar. And as impressive as this 
this, uh, maybe we would say career advancement was loneliness would be an issue in David's life for an extended period of time. And my friends, if there's anything that this pandemic has spawned, if there's anything uh, that has become a reality in the times in which we live, it is loneliness. It is isolation. Uh, loneliness and isolation or at epidemic levels. And uh, this pandemic has not only spawned an increased isolation, but oh, glory to God, he has also exposed our God-given need for relationships and a community. Uh, because uh, whether you realize it, you and I, we were created by God for community, we were created by God for relationship, and even in the very beginning, uh, it was God himself who says it is not good that man should be alone. And it's interesting that there in Genesis, uh, when the word of God says that it is not good that man should be alone, that word man is not referring to male gender, but rather it is the word for mankind and when God created mankind God created us with a built in natural need for relationships a built in natural need uh, to be in community with one another but during this season of the uh, pandemic and COVID-19 uh, I agree with Rick Warren who said this. This is what he says. He says that we are more connected by technology than ever before. Yet there is an epidemic of loneliness in the world. Uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch uh, uh, printed in a giant size print that depression and anxiety have spiked in the midst of the COVID outbreak. And about half of U.S. adults report some kind of signs of discouragement, some kind of signs of depression. And the reality is, is that if there's ever a time that loneliness, every time the discouragement, every time that uh, depression uh, invades lives, uh, it is now. Now, uh, don't confuse that we are technologically connected, that we're, again, we're doing well. Again, all the technology from email to voicemail to text mail and snail mail, and now we're zooming here and zooming there, but the reality is is that technology can never replace that God-given need for relationships in our walk with one another. But I got good news for you that despite what these times have done, we serve a God. Yes, we may be separated from family. We may be separated from friends. But the word of God says, he says, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. The very characteristic of God, God is omnipotent, uh, which means he's all powerful. God is omniscient, which means he knows everything. But God is also omnipresent, which means that God is everywhere at all times. And there's nowhere you and I can go where God is not. And so God God tells us in the word of God, he even tells us when we go through the floods, he'll be with us. When we go through the fire, uh, he'll be with us. Now, he didn't say we won't go through the fire. He didn't say we won't go through the flood. He didn't say we won't go through sickness and setbacks in life. But we serve a God 
who guarantees that we will never be alone. Now, there is, I, I want to mention this, there is a difference now being alone versus being lonely. See, it's possible to be alone, but not lonely. And it's also possible uh, to be lonely, but not be alone. In other words, it is possible to be by yourself, but not be and feel lonely. But oh, glory to God, it is also possible to be surrounded by people, surrounded by things, and be just as lonely as all outdoors. And so even though David was surrounded by all of the trappings of success, all of uh, uh, Saul's palace and, and, and all of a sudden becoming popular. And in a moment, we'll get to that that popularity got him in trouble. But for now, although David was surrounded by people, it was a time of loneliness. But look what God did. God brought into David's life, uh, someone, Jonathan, who would not only be among those rare jewels, who would be a best friend and a covenant friend that would be limited in number, but also Jonathan would be one who would, would uh, enable the fact that loneliness would be banished. And so when it comes to best friend forever, those kind of relationships are limited in number. Secondly, when it comes to best friends forever, loneliness is banished. But thirdly, when it comes to Best friends forever. Look at this. Loyalty is the barometer. Uh, loyalty is the barometer because when it comes to loyalty, when it comes to loyalty and allegiance to God puts all other relationships in perspective. And here, if you would look, in uh, uh, the, 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 the word of God, it says that what Jonathan did in chapter 18 and verse 4, it says after there was this bonding, after there was this uh, banishing of loneliness, it says what Jonathan did. Jonathan took off the robe that was on him. Not only he took off the robe that was on him, but he gave it to David. But not only did he take off the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David, but he took off his own armor including his sword and his bow and his belt that symbolize the holding together of armor. But even though, and in addition to what Jonathan did, look in verse 9, because it says, uh, in verse 9, that from that day on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Now, the significance going back to chapter 18, verse 4, when Jonathan took off his robe, when Jonathan took off all of those royal 
symbols of power and leadership and gave them to David. What he was doing was saying, David, I'm aware that God has a special calling in your life and future. And David, due to our covenant relationship, I am willing to help you get from where you are to where you're going, even if it costs me the very thing. Uh, see, Jonathan was likely older than David. Jonathan was likely more experienced as a soldier than David. And definitely Jonathan was entitled to the throne as the king's son. But what one of the things that when it comes to true loyalty, true loyalty means is that there's a person who's willing to get you where, get you from where you are to where you're going, even if it costs them. And I agree with the person who said that a few men have the natural strength to honor a friend's success without envy. Let me repeat that. Few men, few women, even few boys and few girls have the natural strength to honor somebody else's success without envy. Matter of fact, when I think about the, uh, the, the struggle with envy, the reality is, is that while, uh, Jonathan grew closer and closer, uh, to, uh, David, uh, chapter 19, Verse 1 and 2 says, Saul now urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David. But Jonathan, because of his close relationship with David, told David what his father was planning. You see this issue of jealousy, this issue of envy, while we salute Jonathan, the reality is, is that uh, Saul became green with envy because after David uh, 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 took out uh, Goliath, the Bible says that uh, David was brought in, as I mentioned a moment ago, into Saul's home or Saul's palace. And for some reason, uh, they went. And, and the next thing we know that here there was the uh, uh, ladies and the women. They had made up a song and they started singing that Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And uh, Saul became envious. Saul became Came jealous and Saul decided uh, somebody's got to go and it will not be me. And Saul allowed envy, Saul allowed jealousy, but whereas Jonathan was willing to honor David's success without envy. And don't ever underestimate uh, the power and the problem with envy. When I think about the problem and power, of envy, it was uh, Oscar Wilde in uh, one of his stories. He discusses how the devil uh, in the story was a so-called cross in the Libyan desert. When he met a number of his associates, uh, demons, trying to tempt a so-called holy man or a holy her or hermit. They tried to tempt the hermit with sins of the flesh, tempting him in every way they knew. But to no avail, uh, the saintly man was steadfast and he shook off all suggestion. And finally, after watching their failure in disgust, the devil whispered to the demons and said, what you all are trying to do is too crude. Permit me one moment. At that moment, the devil whispered this to the holy man. He simply said in his ear, your brother 
has just been made a bishop. And at that moment, a scowl of jealousy crossed the serene face of the so-called holy man. And at that point, Satan turned to his subordinates and said, that is the sort of thing that I recommend. You see, many of us are fine as long as our friends have less than we do. But then don't we don't want them to move ahead of us. And the question becomes, uh, when it comes to loyalty, loyalty says is that it doesn't matter even if uh, you have to go ahead. Uh, I am willing to be loyal. Oh, but I want you to see what real loyalty is and real loyalty is tested is it not only was Jonathan willing to uh, help David get from where he is Jonathan unfortunately had to face the test of who he was going listen now who he was going to be loyal to his father or his best friend and Jonathan proved his loyalty to David in times of testing. And this is the problem. Here, his father has now been stripped of the Holy Spirit. And his best friend is full of the Holy Spirit. And Jonathan was caught between the proverbial devil and deep blue sea. And who in the world wants to pass the pick between their father and a best friend? But oh, I, I, I want you to know today is that when it comes to loyalty, we have to, when it comes to the issue of loyalty, we are not talking about blind loyalty. But this is what biblical loyalty is. And biblical loyalty says this, is that my allegiance to God puts all other relationships in perspective. And it wasn't that Jonathan loved his father less than David, but the issue is, is that Jonathan looked at what God's word says, and when it came to Jonathan, truth always guided his loyalty, and Jonathan realized that the source of truth was God and demanded his ultimate loyalty. And what biblical covenant relationships do, they do not base their friendship on each other, but what they do, they base their commitment to God. It was Jesus himself who says that unless you hate father and mother uh, uh, or love them more than me, and or unless you hate father and mother, you can't follow me. And often that phrase is misunderstood is because Jesus was not calling us to hate, as it were, our father, our mother. But he was saying that we are to love him supremely so much so that our love for him transcends our love for anyone else. And there will be times in your walk with God, you will have to choose whether or not you're going to please people, even a so-called friend, or will you choose to please God? And for Jonathan, his loyalty was based on an allegiance to God, which put all other relationships in perspective. And so uh, when it comes to best friends forever, first of all, covenant relationships are limited in number. Second, covenant relationships, uh, they loneliness is banished, but also loyalty is the barometer. 
uh, I close with this, is that uh, one day there was a minister who was visiting a hospital. And this hospital was in a crowded city, in a crowded hospital. And uh, so while the minister was there, one of the nurses asked him to say an encouraging word to a particular sick man whose bed was near the minister. And so uh, the minister went in and said, well, with pleasure. But then the nurse said to him, he is asleep. So, uh, well, he, she said to him, he really is not asleep. The motionless issue is that he is dying. And so what the minister did, he noticed that over the bed was this sign, Robert Browning, age 70. And then it said, no friend. The minister asked the nurse, what did that mean? And she said, well, if he dies tonight, we do not know anyone who knows him. Uh, and so what the minister did, he bent over the bed and he said quietly in the ear of the man, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. And in that moment, those closed eyes open in a moment. Uh, all of a sudden, there was this response by the man. And this is what he said. He said, yes, Jesus is my savior and Jesus is my friend. You see, the sign said, no friends. But I declare that man proclaimed and claimed the greatest of friendships. And when it comes to the best of friends, we may have good friends on earth, but the best friend is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because even as Jonathan stripped himself of his garments for David, Jesus died on Calvary's cross for my sins and your sins. And Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it white. Yes, no. Do you know Jesus is your savior, the best friend on this earth? If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, oh, we invite you to receive him now. And as you go through life, uh, you may be battling loneliness. God is with you. As you struggle with loyalty issues, choose him and trust him to work all things together for good. God bless you on this day as we've considered the best friends forever. Join us, Lord, say the same next Sunday as we continue to consider what best friends really look like. May God be glorified and honored today through his word and our worship.